in the film, we use this line from the scripture, better millstone be hung around your neck that you be cast into the sea that you should ever hurt one of these little ones. And Jesus, there is a side to him that you don't want to mess with and people are messing with him. And I believe that when our hearts become on fire, you're not afraid of anything. The story is the film industry supports all matter of causes. Yet there are some stories which they seem to steer clear of, including the life of Christ, and on the other end of the spectrum, exposing the evils of human trafficking. Yet brave people like actor Jim Caviezel have tackled both subjects. Today we discuss the quality of courage in film and in life. I'm Joel Ackerman. This is Lightwise. Jim Caviezel is an American film and TV actor who has starred in hits such as The Count of Monte Cristo and The Passion of the Christ. In 2022, he starred in Sound of Freedom as Tim Ballard, the anti-human trafficking activist credited with saving thousands of trafficking victims. The film from Angel Studios comes out July this year. Here's a clip from Sound of Freedom. No, Tim O'Dell, the kid, Miguel, back with his father, huh? Yes. How'd that make you feel? Giving a child his freedom. So good. Like, back rub good or chicken wings good. What kind of good are we talking about here? The kind that gives hope? Come on, amigo. You have been at this for 12 years. Why are you doing it? Because God's children are not for sale. Jim, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Joel. Good to be here. Um, one of the things that has always um, made me curious is why this cause, the fight against human trafficking, is not higher on most people's lists. This one seems so horrible. Mm -hmm. Is that the reason why more people aren't willing to tackle it? What what's going on? Why isn't this? Why isn't there more awareness? Why isn't there more people pursuing this cause of all the causes? Well, human nature, uh, a lot of it. If you look through history, there were soldiers that came in on some of the death camps. There were many of them. You know, Auschwitz is one of the biggest ones, but there were other uh, ones that you never heard of, and. Um, at some point, whether you were a Russian soldier coming upon the camps or American soldiers, they would come upon them and um, um, they would see the, the death and the slaughter just is beyond. Now, let's say if you were that soldier and you were wounded uh, in battle shortly after that, you would have come home maybe two years prior to the war ending. You would have told people what you saw and would have called you a liar. And I've been through that even on this film. Trafficking is just the beginning of the conversation here. It's gonna go a lot worse, but in order for it to get better, we have to shine the light on it, on any evil. And we have, in a lot of ways, Christians, especially modern day Christians, and I, and I, even, I know this, um, that they're more afraid of the devil than they are of God. And, and the power of God is uh, there's a side of love that is pure terror. And people should be a lot more afraid of who God is than of the devil. But what is up with the trafficking is nothing short of the devil. In the film, we use this line from the scripture, better millstone be hung around your neck that you be cast into the sea that you should ever hurt one of these little ones. And Jesus, there is a side to him that you don't want to mess with, and people are messing with him. And I believe that when our hearts become on fire, you're not afraid of anything. What do you say to the people who are afraid? What do you say to the people who are doing as you're saying? They're good people, but they're afraid to look the evil in the eye. They're afraid to... You know, I've read the articles about what some of these uh, child sex traffickers do to the children. 
to to keep them imprisoned and just the horribleness of it and i and it it's seared in my brain as i'm sure it is in yours when you when you learn these things and it makes me want to look away it makes me want to go it's too dark i do, i don't want to picture a child in that circumstance what do you say to that person who goes it's it's too dark i i know it's bad but i can't look at it i can't be aware of it even listen if if you went to australia all right and uh, we filmed a movie out there one time and it was playing golf and um, there's a red line that goes around the pond and they have what is called an estuarine crocodile it's a saltwater cro crocodile and these mm -hmm. things can be over 20 feet in length but nonetheless if they take you it says humans they will kill you and every year sure enough people have to get taken and 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 hopefully learn not to do it but they don't um those crocodiles are man eaters and um uh and <laughs> the person that's doing that if he were to go there and i say look i'm going to give you i know you're going to have a nice round of golf today but if you your ball lands anywhere past that red line don't ever go near it and they will eat you and that man might say to me well oh, you just ruined my day of golf thank you no thank you whatever and, and then if, and he goes and his ball crosses the line and he thinks about it now he doesn't like me he might have not much good to say about me at that point when i said that to him but he might remember wow he said don't cross that line about those crocodiles right and um and literally that's that's your life there now what about your children what would you do for your children you, you listen to that uncomfortable thing that's going on what if you know you're at a i don't know a, a family picnic and some guy stalks your daughter because i've watched it many times takes your own child now at that point would you have been willing to listen to someone like tiff ballard would you have been willing to wish that you listened to him that's a moment of inconvenience but a long long payment of pain when you or your your uh, uh your own child or your your niece or your best friend's daughter it's a horrible sound the screaming because you're most likely never going to see that child again so i i was um talking to a a group of um, navy seals and was, they're amazing guys i have their instructor shirt on i was i did the gi jane and um i got to know their community really well and um it's fascinating um when they were talking about great white sharks you know how to um when you're swimming out in the water and you're looking down black and probably there's a great white shark looking up at you and the great white shark you know most of the time they bump you before they eat you you don't know that but it's true now if they bumped you and it's a two-ton fish what would you do you'd probably swim for sure wouldn't you get the heck out of there but you the splashing the the great white shark has all these nerves on his bill and when you splash you're activating them you make him seriously hungry now he can go 40 miles an hour in the water do you really think you can out swim a fish that can go that fast you don't have a chance your only chance if he comes up and bumps you is attack him go for his eye now you might say oh my god what am i doing i'm attacking a two fi two ton fish but he didn't he doesn't know that he doesn't know he weighs two tons he just wants an easy kill right that's all he wants and you're just you're smarter than him so you turn you attack him and he runs you know where to hit him in his eye maybe his gill and he goes he runs away that's your only chance of survival so um, if you program that in your brain you might you know all of a sudden swim and all of a sudden but you got to program it in your system what i love talking about tim is tim will tell me this is what you look for this is how they look this is how they hunt this is where they are and once you do that then you stop being the prey you become the predator mm. you got to be smarter than that two-ton fish and 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 uh and most people are like no no i'm not doing that i'm swimming for sure i said well you know even the fastest swimmer in the world is not going to outrun that fish 
Yeah, both those metaphors, the, the crocodile metaphor and the shark metaphor, remind me, and I know, I know you would appreciate uh, this this was something that came to me as inspiration of this this thought, but it reminds me exactly of these two metaphors, which was when you seek to escape suffering, you multiply mm. suffering. You have to That's face beautiful. it. That's beautiful. That's you have to face it. Well, let's look at the sound of music. What a beautiful movie, right? Yeah. But at some point, Maria says, "You to the to the daughter house, oh, sweetheart. You can't run away from your problems. You got to face them." You know, and then she sings a song, and it's really good. <laughs> but it's true. It's we we believe that, and we love the moment in there, uh, the 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 courage of what that is. Let's yeah. think about the word courage. What sound of freedom is? It's about courage. It's not a victim movie. Not a victim movie. It's about courageous individuals that are Christ-like, like Tim Ballard. He's a guy that heard a voice. I'm a guy that heard a voice from God and became an actor. He's a guy to help these children, no matter what. And he's gonna be attacked, and he has to be attacked. We were attacked heavily, Mel and I, on the um, Passion of the Christ. I was gonna say we're doing the resurrection soon. Right. Um, it's gonna be amazing. But I was struck by lightning, not on the cross, but, it, on a, but my shoulder was dislocated. I had two uh, heart surgeries, including open heart. I was, at the end of the movie, it's blue, and Someone was with me and they paused and they said, what are you going, what's going through your head right at that moment? I said, well, I was facing a very heavy headache and I was um, spinning in my head and I threw up and Mel came up and he goes, are you done? And I heard a voice in my heart, it was Jesus. And I asked him to be real close to me, but he said, am I too close? And I said, you're not close enough. Because there's a point where love is so great, I, I give my life. And you look at the scripture, it says, no greater love have you than to lay your life down. That's where, that's where man needs to eventually be when he becomes at a point where fearlessness. Why do you have fearlessness? Because of love. The love. Perfect love. Ah, it's fantastic. Yeah. I didn't want to come down. I was freezing. I went through all that, but I felt his love for me for doing what we were doing, and I didn't want to come down. I was in heaven even though I was in horrible pain. I felt something that was extraordinary. It, it, the persecutions were hard. I didn't work a lot after that movie, even though the, the film was so big. I don't want to be an individual that's all about saving my own ass, <laughs> especially if it comes to my own children yeah. or your child, Right. that I care more about your child than myself. I think that that is natural though. The unnatural is pedophilia. The unnatural is this transgenderism. It's attack on the family. Absolutely. Do I love my career more than I love my family? Hell no. Yeah. Modern day um, Christianity, and a lot of it's, you know, just bullshit. Um, it is, I don't know what better word to say, because um, um, it's not. Christianity. Um, long time ago, it was always, you know, if you do this, you go to hell. If you do this, you go to hell. And then it became like fire and brimstone. You know, truth, all truth. But if you have all grace and sleep with Susie on Friday, Catherine on Saturday, go to church on Sunday and the blood washes all, it's bullshit. It has to be both. Right. Both truth and grace. The reality is that mankind has from the beginning has said no and chose sin. And they listen to another father of lies who tells them that sin, it's not sin. There it's, is no sin. It's freedom. Yeah. It's real freedom. It's not. So we're either going to be a slave of the devil or a slave of God. But my slavery to God is my free will that says I want to be because I don't want to fall into the sin and I need your protection and I want people to know my God. And so in the industry, when I came in, I was, Jesus held me like a little lamb. You know, he called me into the business and asked me to be an actor. And, and I thought maybe that his calling was me playing Jesus one day. 
and it was, but I didn't know at the time. And You had that thought early on. No, it was a presence that hit me in a theater. I felt a presence come over me. It was love that I've never known, like I was his only child that he had. And I couldn't believe he loved me that much. And I, I somehow, you know, I, I was able to exemplify that in the world when, when people watch the movie, they feel how much God loves them. That's the power behind it. And I felt that way when I watched Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life. God, if you're out there, please, please, please help me. And that, that scene breaks me up every time I see it. And he wants to help us. And we just need to cry out to him. And it's the only way to get us out of where we're in right now. You see, this freedom, this, uh, sorry, this um, fear, this fear of, of our flesh. But unlike you, Joel, I know I'm going to die someday. <laughs> We all are gonna die, right. right? So when I go, my friend um, Christoph um, was John in The Passion of the Christ. Okay. And he just passed away last month. Mm. And I'm not afraid of death. And he said to me, I'm not afraid. And this man was my John in The Passion. Yeah. And he died of very young age and um, died of pancreatic cancer. And, um, you know, he, I prayed with him. I held his hand, was there when he, <laughs> right down to the end. And, um, you know, he's a soul in heaven now fighting for us when we do the resurrection. And he'll fight for us when we do Sound of Freedom. Um, because we're under principalities of light and darkness, the angels and demons and, and things that are beyond in the supernatural world that we, you know, can't comprehend. But I feel it in my heart, in the gentleness when I, you know, I'm here in Provo, I'm looking up at the mountains and saying, wow, you know, wow, God, you did that. That's amazing, you know. Yeah. It's just, it. it's a light that burns in my heart. And uh, uh, and it's so simple. And, and um, you know, when I came into the acting thing, it was like, you know, you're too stupid. You know, you can't do this. And who, and I say in my prayers, God, I'm too stupid to do this. I can't be an actor. And he said, he said, who told you you were stupid? You know, he kind of like when you go to the Garden of Eden, when he says, they said, we, why Adam, Eve, where are you? And they were hiding in the bushes and they came out. Why were you hiding? We were naked. God comes back always with the big answer, question and, and answer. And he says, who told you you were naked? Well, Jim, who told you you were stupid? <laughs> stupid is stupid. Does, yeah. <laughs> Jim, most people, uh, even most people who believe like you do, believe that there are, as you say, principalities and spiritual powers at work, God, the devil, uh, maybe spirits and angels on those two sides. They believe that. They don't talk about it like you do openly, typically. Maybe they do in church. But we're here on a, what is it, <laughs> Friday, Thursday afternoon, and we're talking about it. Yes. Do you feel like you have um, always been had this per eternal perspective, this spiritual perspective, or was um, the passion a transformative experience? What, what makes you talk openly about these beliefs, which myself and others may share, but we may not talk openly about it as you are? Well, I never talked openly about it for a long time, but I made dumb decisions. And, uh, but I always felt something different, you know, um, when people were doing things that were not of God, uh, I did them and then I felt, they'd say, well, this is just your Catholic guilt talking. And I said, yeah, you're right. But it wouldn't go away. And then it was like, who are you that, who are you that speaks to me, you know, kind of a thing where, and then I got to a point where I, I'd be careful how I say this, desperation 
and I ask God, please help me. And, you know, I was reading a book about um, this um, guitarist, famous guitarist, um, Eric Clapton. And they say Clapton is God. Well, um, he's not God, but God works through him, and Clapton allows him to. And Clapton, I read his biography and was so blown away by it, but I was he was so um, uh, transparent when he was in his kitchen and he fell to the ground and he cried out to God, help me. I think I, I know I had that moment. And God ter- comes to you and says, okay, you know, um, I'm here. So um, I'm asking you to become an actor. I had to have a lo- I I knew I couldn't do that, but there was something in me that it's um, the idiot, maybe, which is, um, well, I don't think I can, but if you say I can, then I know I can, but only because you say I can. So when Mel and I do the resurrection or the passion, I still have the frailties of a human in me, and but I philosophically, I don't have the learned books as, you know, I'm not Jordan Peterson. I really enjoy listening to him speak, but I do have one thing, and that is whatever he tells me, I will do. But the family is under attack right now, especially the Holy Family. And um, we as Christians have to, we have to fight. And, you know, it can take my career from me. Most of it has been taken from me. but um, uh, I still have the truth in my heart uh, that God loves me, and maybe I can witness that to other people, that if God can love someone like me, then he, I know he can love them. And I always ask Jesus in my intention when I'm playing him that people know they're loved by you and how I play you. But maybe it's better that I don't play you, Jesus. Maybe you should play me. And in life, when God plays me, Jesus plays me, then I am a much better man. Mm, I love that. Um, You know, you mentioned God playing you or acting through you. Mm. Uh, You mentioned Eric Clapton. Obviously, both of you are celebrities, but you've said that every person even if we never know their name, every single person, wherever they are, has people or a person that they can save. Um, Can you talk a little bit about your belief in that, that it doesn't take a a famous person, you don't have to have a platform to allow Jesus to work through you? What I was referencing, or what you're referencing earlier, is that... All of us have different gifts. In fact, I've said this before that I think Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player that ever was. I have no doubts on that. Each one of us has a Michael Jordan talent. Mm -hmm. We all have a gift that's so rare. You gotta find what that gift is. And and what a lot of times is that you could be born in an area where I didn't know I could um, uh, do movies and do what I'm doing. I didn't know I could do any of that. I didn't know I could do Aramaic I couldn't, or Hebrew or Latin or any of that yeah. stuff. Um, but God knew it. And um, and I was scared in doing it, but do you dare try? And I did, and it just kept going. And, um, and so after the movie was over, The Passion, people would say, I, I didn't know God back then, and, and now I know Jesus because of what that movie was, what it did, how it tried to transform my prisoners, and, uh, killers, p- uh, uh, military guys, guys that came up to me that had killed people with their bare hands and were shot and, and want to talk to me. Well, God loved me. I saw that movie. Would he love me? You know, yes, he would love you. So I was able to do that. And, um, but I never lost that childlike quality in my soul of who I was. 
when someone said to me, here you are, Jim, as an adult, and here you are, a child, I said, me as a, a child and my adult, I'm one and the same. I still have that child in me because um, I've tried to turn my way from the sin. And with that power, if you ha use your Michael Jordan talent, you are able to reach people that I can't reach. But if you were to die, let's look at It's a Wonderful Life, for example. Okay. If Jimmy Stewart, in the character that he's playing, if Jimmy Stewart's character had died, the angel shows him, these people would not make it without you. Think of it that way. That's the power of film, power medium of films like The Passion of the Christ and the best film I've done since The Passion is Sound of Freedom. That is the power behind this movie. Yes, they're going after a child. They're going after that child. But what if that child was your child? And he went after that child like it was his child. What well, doesn't Jesus talk about the lost sheep? Those are his children. And, and, and that lost sheep, he turns to a shepherd like me and says, will you watch guard over? And, and watch the sheep while I'm gone. Well, in some ways I'm a converted wolf. So think of it this way. Most people, Jesus reaches out. He says, you see a storm and you think you're gonna drown. Early in my life, it was like that. And he would say, don't look anywhere but my eyes. And he reach out. If you just focus on that, you, you'll, you'll get to safety, okay? But later, as I graduated further closer to Jesus, Jesus became inside me. So now when I'm looking, I'm hawking the devil. I'm looking for the devil to kill him, to take him out because I'm not afraid of him. That's the difference. So the power that's in me, you know, greater that is in you than is in this world, believe it because it is absolutely true. Is this why you say that Sound of Freedom is the second most important film you've ever done? <sighs> Because it's in, taking down in, Satan, Satan in the Of course story. it is. Of course it is. But if you look at biblically, what happened during the time of Pharaoh? They're killing the babies. Right. What is happened during the time of Jesus? What did Herod do? He's killing the babies. Right. To kill who? Christ. Why are we there? And we're okay with that. I'm not going to be okay with that. Is it worth my life? My career? Are you kidding me? That's the last thing I'm thinking about. I, that I've lived in a time where more barbarism and now than has ever been, especially with the, the young, the babies. So it is the most important. Now, execution, Alejandro Monteverdi is as genius of a director that I've ever worked with. This guy is absolutely brilliant. So as a film, it's phenomenal. Is it gonna get any awards? <laughs> Never. Mm -hmm. In this time period, it is, do you want the recognition of man or do you want to be recognized by God? But man, the best thing that man can do is like you. You know why? Because love doesn't come from man. It only comes from God. So do you want to be liked by many or loved by one? That's the choice that man has to make right now. Hmm. And that is not a choice for me. Look, you've got three sides. You've got the good on the one side. You've got the evil on the other. And then you've got the long fence. Two of those. One is a good decision. Two of them are very bad. Most people are on that damn fence. And really it's the fight over the middle third. Who's gonna join my side? Who's gonna join theirs? And I'll fight to the end to get all of them on my side. Yeah. Forget about the evil ones. For shame on us that did nothing that rode the fence in this time. One could consider that that might be the most evil group of all because if that group were to get it together and get out, out of their fear, if that group fought, this wouldn't be going on right now. And sadly it is. Do you feel like Sound of Freedom will move the needle toward getting people <laughs> off the fence? It already is. It's been kept in the dark in the last four years. They've been wanting this thing to go away and it hasn't. Thank God for Angel, you know? Were you already aware of Tim Ballard's story? Um, and how significant was it to you that the man himself requested you play him and how much of a factor did that play into your accepting the role? At some point, 
uh, Eduardo Verastegui and um, Alejandro Monteverdi met with me and they were going somewhere else with it and they offered me the movie and then Tim Ballard came over and then I started to know a little bit about him, but I'd already seen quite a bit of stuff. It was pretty bad. And um, I had, probably had ability to compartmentalize. The only thing I wasn't able to compartmentalize is the screaming of little children and why that was going on. And um, um, Tim came down to um, Columbia and at some point he was talking to me and Mira Servino about uh, organ harvesting of little children. And that just shocked me. And uh, so um, he, when he came down, I just said, look, I owe you a lot and I want you to know that this film is going to be phenomenal. Um, and if it wasn't f phenomenal, it would be much easier for it to get out um, because it is going to be phenomenal. Um, you're going to have a lot of problems. Uh, we had a lot of problems on the passion and eventually God took care of that. So good vi eventually wins. Um, if it come out four years ago, more of the public probably wouldn't have watched the movie because they didn't, wouldn't have known as much about the trafficking of children. But Tim came to me because he saw, I asked him why he came to me. He said, well, I saw The Passion and I saw Count of Monte Cristo and the two of my favorite films. And I was, I've been in, clearly indebted to this guy because he has a child of Christ in his heart. And, um, and I really focused on that between us um, is you have a man there, a warrior, but something that is, is deep. And I focused on that childlike quality. And I think that that comes through in the movie because it's that child in you that says, you're a man now, you're strong. And these little children, they can't defend themselves. And people like Tim Ballard, I'm afraid of it. And then it goes back to be not afraid. Thank you for sharing that. Certainly you you made deep connections yeah. making the Passion of the Christ. I, uh, and then people, because of their personal spiritual experiences with the film, feel a connection to you. Yeah. Is that a burden, number one? And number two, are you at all worried or anticipating about the potential horrible stories and uh, s other experiences that people will uh, possibly share with you after Sound of Freedom because they'll connect with you in in that film hmm. with with their personal experiences with their families and children and et cetera. Have you contemplated that? And, and is that a, is that a burden or is that a blessing? It's a good burden. Sorry for the oxymoron, but it's a, it's a good, it's a good burden. Uh, it could be worse. I think you have to look at your life. Like you know, if I were to live my life where uh, let's say I didn't do the passion. Let's say I didn't do sound of freedom. Say I'm going to play it safe. I don't want to get involved in that stuff. I, I'm sure I would have had a formidable career. I'm sure awards would have been at least considered. Um, and I think that I would have made a lot more money. Um, but what would happen would if I would have looked back and said, that was the one that got away, you know? And I met my wife. We dated for a year and we broke up. And um, about six months uh, of that. And I realized I made the worst decision of my life. I literally got on the edge of my bed and I said, I made a bad decision. Um, I'm not easy to love. Um, it's quite hard to be married to an actor because you have to play different characters um, and different people. And there's a lot of 
um, where are you at? Are you checking out? Well, actually, now I'm memorizing my lines right now, or I'm mm-hmm. thinking about that character, and I'm not aware I'm doing it. And um, I don't, and I think it's hard in the family too because it's all about you, you know, you, and you you got to vie with that, you know, because uh, it can't be. And so, but I would look back um, on my wife if, if I didn't. Um, go through reconciliation there and eat crow and say, hey, I was, screw- I, I, w- I was dumb. Um, I would have made the worst decision in my life at that time. And um, uh, I've seen people do that all the time. And they say, well, I'll find someone else. And, um, and she was a dream, you know, and, and the passion was a dream and Sound of Freedom was a dream. You don't want to look back and go, boy, I made a big mistake there. I should have done that. If And so... Um, Jordan Peterson said, this life, you're not called to happiness. It's a call to adventure, you know, Mm. and it is an adventure. Do you feel like part of, uh, do you feel like you've held on to um, darkness, negative experiences that maybe other people would want to process so that you can use it as you play these difficult, challenging roles? What a a great question, Joel. I did this movie, um, Deja Vu, with Denzel Washington. And in that movie, I played a Unabomber. Um, While I was working on the movie, I had to look at a lot of video of... um, It it was written for a um, serial killer, but it was more of, of a Jeffrey Dahmer... Um, um, a Jeffrey Dahmer, a um, um, Ted Bundy kind of uh, kill, serial killer. But um, so the, the FBI and ATF gave me a lot of videos on watching these guys. And I sat there and took a lot of notes, but serial killers aren't just serial killers. There's a big difference between um, somebody who would be in Al Qaeda or ISIS. Um, um, versus somebody who's um, a regular um, serial killer like a Jack the Ripper, Ted Bundy kind. Very different cats. And, um, and so um, I would say that in, in, in doing a film like that, um, I didn't go and ask, and in this particular character, I didn't go to the devil to ask him how to play the devil. I go to God to ask him how to play the devil. Because mm. God tells me the truth. The evil one will always lie to me. Mm. So in that, you, you're built a certain way to handle these things. But you have to come back to peace. You have to come back to calm. Because the evil one will slip in there and tell you, oh, well, you need to hold on to these things because if you do, then you'll be a better actor. That's a lie. Mm. You'll never have, you got to have the place to come to peace. And it's very important because even a sniper can feel his heartbeat and he's calm. He's not holding on. He's very, very calm and he can feel his heartbeat and he shoots between beats. That's how still you have to be as a, if you want to be, uh, at the level where um, Mel Gibson and I ventured to go in fashion, you feel your heartbeat. And, um, but the reality is, do I want to be a great, if I had to make a choice, do you want to be a great actor? Or you want to be a great father or a great husband? I would say a great husband first and then father, because if I'm a bad husband, I can't be a good father to my children. So that has to be number one in the family. You've said that multiple people have tried to put down this story or uh, stop it from coming out. And um, there were a couple investigative journalists, Lynn Packer and Damian Moore of American Crime Journal, that reported that Tim Ballard lied about his involvement in a case uh, that's portrayed in the film and fabricated details about his activities. Have you looked into their claims at all? Is it something you even pay attention to? Are you even aware of it? You know, when you're doing a movie like um, The Count of Monte Cristo, you got about 88 characters in that book. 
So a purist is going to say, I hate that film. Okay, right. What, what, what do you want me to do? Do you want, me, you, you want to watch a 40-hour movie? You can, <laughs> but that's a different movie, okay? I don't have time to take uh, 88 characters and put them down to 14, and that's the crap that they write, all right? Um, uh, what's interesting about it is I, I was watching an interview with Donald Trump, and I'm, this is an analogy, um, and they were asking you know Donald Trump about something about... Um, Q or something and 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 children and and he goes but there are something about but trump comes back and says but helping children you know stopping pedophiles and that, that that's good isn't it um it's extraordinary that they would um uh, uh write that um um even before the passion came out we had people that came out against the movie and never saw the movie right um there was a guy out of Notre Dame, McBride, I think his name was. He came out against the movie. He'd never seen it. I thought that was amazing. An expert that never saw it, the film. Maybe he came out and did his part there. Um, I'd be amazed. He put the rest of the people in the room, um, about 1,500 people that I saw in a room, and have them make those statements. Um, because there would be a lot of people that would counter big time uh, with that. Um, and I think that... Um, from what Tim has been through and what Tim has seen, uh, these guys would cry like little girls. You know, early 2000, if you said anything about trafficking, that's not true. That's not true. It'd be in the media and it's gone the next day. And that's been relatively this, been what's been going on all along. Like it's in the news and then next day it's gone. I think that's fascinating, isn't it? It's strange. Um, uh, I have so much to say. Uh, you know, I'm obviously in Hollywood for many, many years and all the funny business that went on there. Right. That's one of the questions that I wanted to ask you about the industry is you've been in the industry since early 90s. Um, so that's 30 plus years, not to date you, but you know, yeah. how has the industry date changed? Me. It's interesting. It's like when you'd go to set and you see people like there'd be books extras and they'd be reading books and stuff and they'd be communicating with each other in the early 90s and throughout cell phones came you know people talk on phone but now it's like nobody talks to each other they're all um they're all uh um into their phones and um so it's less social no oh yeah no they, they absolutely people don't connect as no. much no they'd be connecting at the end of the movie and things like that so that's different um and um, but in the early 2000s, you know, if you mentioned trafficking, they would say that's, a, forget about child trafficking, just human trafficking. That's not, that's not true. That's what it was back then. And then that became true. And then, you know, um, you would hear constantly with the media, that's not true. That needs to be fact checked. And then that becomes true. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How come all these things, you know, two and two is four, always will be four. If you said two and two is five, I'd say, well, wait a minute, we got a problem here. Right. Where did you get, you know, but then articles come out and they say, well, that's been fact checked. Well, who are the fact checkers? Right. Who are these guys? Uh, what doctorate degree did they get? Where, where, where an expert, can, can you meet some of my fact checkers? Because right. my fact checkers actually have stuff that will blow your mind that you can't put on TV. So do you think this film will rip the Band-Aid off? Is that your hope? Uh, that it will just rip the Band-Aid off and just lay bare at least, not everything. Like you said, it, you can't do everything in two to hours. The, to the person that's sitting there watching them, when he hears that, you go, oh, okay. When I'm saying, do you want to be a man? Do you want to, you know, I, I know a lot of, uh, you know, there's a, you have to earn becoming a man, man. It's if, if, if you're a boy, then you become a, um, a, a guy. And lot, there are a lot of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year old guys I know because they never accepted responsibility. If you're into raw courage, <laughs> watch this movie. If you're into victim, don't come to this film. We're not victims in this. Jim, thank you so much for taking time and sharing your heart and sharing your true feelings with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. Sound of Freedom, starring Jim Caviezel, is now playing in theaters across the U.S. See the film currently sweeping the nation and shining a light on the atrocity of child sex trafficking. Visit angel.com slash tickets to get your tickets now.
Lightwise is a video podcast production of Angel Studios released every other Tuesday. To watch more episodes or be notified of new episodes of Lightwise, click subscribe or download the Angel app now, wherever you get your apps. If you'd prefer to listen instead of watch, you can find the Lightwise audio podcast version wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of Lightwise was hosted by Joel Ackerman. It was written and directed by Joel Ackerman, produced by Cameron Jackson and John Shea Van Sickle, and edited by Cameron Jackson, with sound recording by Garrett Briggs and sound mixing by Brian Densley.